Find the good place where the blessings flow. It's in God's will. It's flowing with God's wisdom and flowing with God's understanding. So to that effect, I'd like to pray. Um, and then we are going to uh, have some outlines available. If anybody hasn't got one, we trust God that he will speak to us through his word this morning. Father, we thank you once again for bringing us together, that Lord, we are a company of believers. We thank you, Lord God, that you've drawn us together in this house. This is our local church, and Lord, you have a word for us this morning. God, you're speaking to the church worldwide, but you have a prophetic word for us, and so we thank you, Father, for speaking to us through the teaching and the preaching of the word. Lord, to bring fresh revelation into our lives, to bring answers and solutions to problems and challenges that we are facing in areas where we are lacking, Lord, your word enriches us. There's wisdom, there's knowledge, and there is understanding that comes. And uh, Lord, you also said that it is for a lack of knowledge that your people perish. So give us knowledge today, Father. Give us the understanding on how to apply it in our lives and help us to live with your wisdom. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, uh, we are ready to launch out. Once again, if you haven't got an outline in your hand, raise up your hand and the ushers, our welcoming team, are going to get you one, and uh, then we're into it. Now, today is the third message in a, uh, a series of messages that I've entitled New Year's Rev Revelations, Resolutions, and Resolves. And it's still the new year. We've just slipped into February. January is finished, is gone, but it's still the new year, and uh, God wants us to have a revelation, a fresh revelation for this year. He wants us to make some resolutions that certain things we will do this year uh, in order to better fit into God's plan, certain resolves that we make uh, in order to fulfill God's purpose for our lives. Um, and uh, as I said, we've just gone into a new year, and we've said that uh, the end of one year is always a fantastic opportunity to lay aside old emotional baggage, old attitudes, bad attitudes that we don't need in the new year. We didn't need them last year either, but we definitely want to start our lives uh, in the new year with a clean slate, with a clean heart, so to speak. And I'm just mindful that some of you have been away. I'd really encourage you to go back and jump on our YouTube channel and get to the messages that we've ministered since the beginning of the year. Peter brought a couple of wonderful messages there early on, and then I came in three weeks ago, coming back from our break, and, and God speaking to us, and so don't be missing out, uh, because it sets us up and it positions us uh, for this year. Psalm 51, and I'll just do a quick recap, very quickly, just hit the headlines on where we've been so far. Psalm 51 verse 10 says, create in me a clean heart and renew a right spirit within me. Friends, a clean heart is more important than what we realize, and a right spirit or a right attitude is more important than what we realize. And uh, we said that success or failure in 2020 is not just determined by what we do or what we don't do, but it is largely determined by our attitude, so that our attitude is good, our attitude is right. Uh, Four points very quickly. We said that the prophetic word for this year was uh, that it is 2020. God wants it to be a year of plenty. All right? 2020, a year of plenty. Uh, of course, God's saying other things, but it's just a phrase that I believe God dropped into my spirit that will hopefully encourage us and raise our faith level towards a more abundant life. Then secondly, or let it be, the condition of our heart determines the level of plenty that we will enjoy in 2020. And then thirdly, or let us see, in the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils, Jesus describes the four different conditions of the human heart. It's very important understanding. And then we said that only the fourth type of soil, the fourth condition of the heart, really only produced any harvest out of the seed that was sown. Now, I don't know about you, but when I read this, immediately I'm interested, saying, okay, what are those four types and how do I get to number four? Because I want to produce fruit this year. Jesus said that for this very purpose, he's called us that we will bring forth much fruit, that we are producers and God's word helps us to do that. So with that, I want to swing into Mark chapter four and uh, carry on uh, from where we have been and uh, Perhaps, uh, you know, uh, forge forward. And uh, point number one there, it says that Jesus teaches the parable of the, so of the growing seed towards a harvest 
of plenty. So what's God talking to us about? Well, God's talking to us about plenty. God's talking to us about our heart. Because the heart has to be right in order for us to experience the plenty. Uh, if we're in God's will, plenty should be the outworking. And if plenty is not there, maybe you're still turning towards God's will. You haven't quite found that place. But God's word will help us to do that. And so here in Mark chapter 4, verse 26, I want to just read those next uh, three, four verses. It says that Jesus said, The kingdom of God is as if a man should scatter seed on the ground, and he should sleep by night and rise by day, and the seed should sprout and grow. He himself does not know how. For the earth yields crops by itself, first the blade, then the head, and after that the full grain in the head. But when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. All right? The harvest has come. Everybody say, the harvest has come. All right? The harvest has come. Um, let me just launch out from here um, and briefly uh, remind ourselves of the understanding that we received last week. And for some of you, this is not new teaching at all. You have uh, heard teaching around the parables that Jesus taught and grasped the concepts and the truths that he's trying to get across to us. But right uh, here in this chapter, from verses 3 to verse 20, Jesus teaches the parable of the sower or the parable of the soils and discusses the four different types of soil. And here, now six verses later, Jesus uses the same example of a sower, soil, seed, in order to teach that parable of what they call the parable of the growing seed. Um, now, the parable of the growing seed is simply a heading that Bible translators have put over the top of that section in the Bible. For all we know, we could call it the, the parable of the harvest. All right, we could call it the parable of, uh, of yeah, growing seed, whatever it is. And so Jesus just got through teaching the parable of the sower, now uses the same concept and swings into another parable, same truths, uh, same examples in order to get a message across to us. Now, in order to recap where we've been and to get the understanding of what this parable now is all about, that number one, we said that the seed is the word of God. All right. There's a man that scatters seed. Well, the seed is the word of God. Then the ground, or in another place there it says the earth or the soil, is our heart. All right, it's your spirit and my spirit. Paul the Apostle speaks about the hidden man of the heart. This is our spirit man. And uh, if that bothers you as a woman, you know that you have a spirit man. It's not about male or female. It's about the hidden person of the heart. All right? So that's where, the, where the, the, the word of God needs to be sown. Then the man who scatters the seed on the ground is you and me. Ultimately, we ourselves are responsible Actually, the only one that's really responsible to sow the Word of God into our own heart. All right? We need to take full responsibility for that. And certainly we've always said over the years that as far as this house is concerned, we are a, we are a, a growth environment. Uh, the reason why we teach the Word of God is so that there is always plenty of Word there, plenty of seeds that people can take in addition to their own Bible reading, in addition to whatever else that they do in order to have always plenty of Word, because in the end, it's only the Word that will produce the harvest that God wants us to have. All right? And then uh, Jesus speaks about the terms here where he talks about the blade, the head, and the full, uh, in fact, let me read it, the full grain in the head. And what that does is it describes the process that uh, the seed undergoes from, first of all, being sown all the way through to harvest time. All right? Blade, and then the, the head, or if you like, the stalk. And then the, the head and then the full grain uh, in the head. Um, now, again, um, some of us have grown up on farms. We understand that process. Some of you do gardening. You know what that looks like. You put a seed in the ground, lightly cover it with soil, water it, make sure you've got plenty of, uh, you know, that you do that not in your 
cell or in some dark room, but you do that outside where there's plenty of light, and somehow there's a process where next minute a blade springs up, and then a plant begins to develop, and next minute there is a, if you're sowing grains, uh, uh, there is a head, and next minute there's all these grains in the head, and then uh, he speaks about, uh, he says, the, the uh, harvest of the fully ripened grain, putting in the sickle, that really refers to the full manifestation of the promises of God that you've sown into your heart. All right, and a little bit later on, as I say, we will continue to expound so that we're able to lay a hold of what exactly that looks like. Friends, understanding of the Word of God is of utmost importance because the seed will not properly germinate until we understand what the Word is talking about. That's like that revelation, that is the germination of the seed. That's why we're always talking about revelation. I'm always praying for revelation for my own life, for your life, because revelation is the germination of the seed. Now, now that's not the harvest yet, but it's part of the process along the way. From sowing the seed to a blade, to a head, to the full grain in the head, to the harvest time, there is a process. All right? Um, and uh, here are some important points to consider, and I want to go back now to kind of break down that uh, parable into bite-sized pieces, into phrases, sentences, if you like, and work our way through it. And hopefully I can do a good job in, in, in putting across that message that I believe that God wants us to lay a hold of so that it touches our heart so we can be ready to receive the plenty that He has. All right? And plenty is not just all about money. We believe in God for plenty of souls this year. People get, get uh, saved. We believe in God for plenty of peace in your life, that your mind's not troubled. We believe in God for plenty of peace in your home, that there is no quarreling and no feuds being fought, but there is plenty of peace. Plenty of good relationships. <laughs> plenty of everything. Verse 26 speaks there of a, a man scatters seed on the ground and he sleeps by night and rises by, rises by day and the seed sprouts and grows. What does that mean? Well, once you've sown the seed of God's word into your heart, you can sleep by night and you can rise by day without worry, knowing that the seed of God's word will sprout and grow in your heart. My father, back on our farm, my father was the sower. Uh, we all helped with the harvest, but he always sowed. That was just his job. I still remember him out there in the early days, before the days of machinery. And that, I know that makes me sound like a fossil, but I'm not as old as what you think you are. I, mean, I sometimes tell somebody stories. Some of you think I'm four or five hundred years old. I'm not that old. I'm really only just a young fella. Okay? But I remember my father going out there with the, with the seed, uh, he had a long apron with a very long sort of a, a cloth on it, and he would bundle that thing together and put from the sack seed into his pouch, and he would literally walk back and forth on the field, and he would scatter seed, and he would just have the same action, a step and a throw, a step and a throw, or maybe two steps, I mean, whatever that was, and he would scatter seed out there. And then once the seed was out there, um, he would sleep by night, and he would rise by day, and he'd not worry. Because he knows that he knows that the ground knows what to do, and the seed knows what to do. He doesn't need to worry. He's not out there the next day and say, "How is my seed doing today?" And is it growing? And oh, let's strain to see if we can get that seed to grow. You don't need to do that. In fact, worry will stop the seed from growing. You got to stop worrying. <laughs> Some of us, when we first got saved, we were. World champion warriors, like which we thought that's what you're supposed to do. I used to worry um, to, until one day, you know, I, I was taught in Matthew, uh, in the, you know, in the, in the, in the, in the Gospels that uh, uh, there, but Jesus teaching is this, do not worry about tomorrow. Well, they're okay, if Jesus says don't worry, then let's stop worrying. We can just absolutely make a decision that there will not be another worrisome thought allowed in our head. 
We will not lie awake at night and worry about this and worry about that because worry cannot add, he, Jesus says, it cannot add one cubic or one centimeter to your, to your height. It cannot ca cause hair to grow. If anything, it'll cause hair to fall out. It's just worry. It just does not help. All right? So we do not worry. Uh, and uh, and uh, so he rises by day and he sleeps by night. Um, and, and, uh, and, and then... And then in verse 27, he says that even though the, the, he says the seed will, uh, will, uh, will grow, sprout and grow, verse 27, he himself does not know how. You know, that was spoken 2,000 years ago before we had all the scientific understanding. I mean, nowadays, scient scientists know what happens. They understand the process, uh, the scientific process. So we have a, a lot of greater understanding today than what they had back then, but whether People understand it or not understand it. If they just know they put the seed out there and make sure that, you know, that there is a, the right environment for it and water the seed and, and let the sun shine on it and all. The seed knows what to do. All right? The Word of God is the seed, and once it's sown into your heart, it knows what to do. And your heart, if it's been cleared of all the stuff, that we talked about last week, it knows what to do. You do not need to worry. So even if you don't know how it works, it still works. The Word of God knows how to produce a harvest in your life. But your heart is of utmost importance and your diligence in putting the Word in. And then the heart knows what to do, the seat knows what to do. Verse 28, for the earth yields crops by itself. What does that mean? Well, as I said, the, har the farmer doesn't have to go out into the field and help the earth to yield. The earth knows what to do. The earth yields crops by itself. So again, once the soil of our heart has been plowed over and the ground been softened and cleared through repentance of repenting of things such as worry, selfishness, and lusts and the various things that Jesus describes in the parable of the sower. Once the heart is clear and clean, it knows how to bring forth by itself. It does not need us worrying to see if we can help the seed grow. Because worry stops the seed from growing. Worry creates an environment where the seed of God's word will not grow properly. In the natural, we know that uh, warmth is very important, light is important, moisture is important. And once we sow the seed of God's Word in our heart, the love of God that flows in our heart and out of our heart creates the right environment. And we are worshippers. Worship helps to, to keep our heart fresh and clean and, 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 and so forth and confessing God's word and all of these are aspects of what we understand uh, and there's a series of those things but it's not rocket science all of these things causes the word of God to grow in our heart it causes the seed to germinate the seed will sprout it brings forth the blade then the head and then the full grain in the head and then you can put in the sickle because the harvest is ready So after we've done what we need to do, our heart knows what to do to bring forth a harvest, and deceit knows what to do to bring forth a harvest. And one of the things that I believe God wants us to focus on just a little more this year is to teach and to speak on character and the need for character development. But sometimes you see Christians and, you know, everything is all good while everything is all good and a little bit of pressure. And next minute you see the other side. You, you see the flesh rising up. The flesh does not help us. 
to grow the seed to its fruition and to bring us into a harvest. We need to walk in the Spirit, Jesus says, so you don't fulfill the lust of the flesh. Get rid of the worry. Get rid of the anger. Get rid of the, self, the, of the selfishness. Get rid, rid of the jealousy out of your heart. These things all stop the seed from growing to produce a fantastic harvest in your life. Verse 29, when the grain ripens, immediately he puts in the sickle because the harvest has come. When the grain ripens. Now, the harvest is the full manifestation of what the Word of God promises. So if you take a promise of God's Word, which is a seed, and put that into your heart after you've cleared away all this other stuff that the Bible speaks about, when the harvest is ready, it means that that promise... Whatever that promise promises has fully manifest in your life. It's there. You can put in the sickle. How many of you know what a sickle looks like? <laughs> Some of us still remember sickles. Uh, I had a little one at home. Uh, used to go out uh, doing a little bit of camping in the early days and then sometimes go out and do a little bit of uh, overnight uh, doing out, being out snorkeling or diving or something and I bring my little sickle along, a little hand sickle and sort of hack away just to cut down. Uh, but actually when in, the, in the farm when I grew up, before, they, before my father purchased a, uh, a motorized mower, the whole family, as I say, mom and dad and some of the neighbors were out there and cutting down the grass and cutting down the thing with... Uh, with a scythe. Uh, how many of you remember the scythe? You know, like this whole uh, blade that's attached to a handle, and you just, by hand, you just, it's actually a sickle on, on a large scale, uh, and, and so forth. And that's uh, the language that Jesus uses, because that's the implements that they used, and that's the understanding that they had. He's telling them a natural story about the processes of farming that they understand in order to convey to, to them a spiritual truth. Many people want to start with the harvest, but God wants us to start with the seed, which is His Word. Gosh, we just like to start with the harvest. Lord, I have it. I want it now. I don't want to wait. I want it now. As I say, I've sort of put a little bit of time into this, uh, uh, you know, into this process of getting this new van, and I'm already like, I want it now. I want to see parked out there so we can use it. And, and we're talking about resurrecting our vain ministry and being able to have some, some options that we perhaps didn't have before. And, uh, and but, but once again, many people want to start with the harvest, but God says, no, I want you to start with the seed. You know, the, the subtitle of this morning's message is that God has designed the seed to meet your need. God's designed the seed to meet your need. And Frank, can I suggest that your attitude towards the seed will largely determine to see if your need's going to be met. Because when Jesus teaches the parable of the sower, and the first type of soil, which is the wayside, the hard ground, this is people who take a flippant approach to the Word of God. Say, ah, who cares, you know, we miss this week's message. There'll be another one next week. Who cares? Flippant. <laughs> but God always builds on uh, the understanding that he brings to us as a house. Point number two on your outline. God's word is imperishable seed, which is alive and powerful. It's the soon is a a new Christian understands the importance of the Word of God and what it really is and the supernatural nature of it and the inherent power within it, the better it is because then they, they're on their journey to receive everything that God has promised because every promise is a seed. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12, for the word of God is alive and powerful. 
That sets the words in the book, in the good book, in the holy book, aside from every other book, <laughs> for every other publication, God's word is alive. You know, you can read an exciting novel, but it's not alive. You can read the newspaper, but it's not alive. In fact, what they're saying today, tomorrow, they're contradicting themselves. Nowadays, there's hardly much point in trying to keep up with the news in terms of the conventional news because everything is so twisted. There's all these twists and turns and what they're telling us, and then you wonder what they're not telling us, and, and then tomorrow they're saying something different to what they said yesterday. It's like, gosh, you know. <laughs> but the Word is alive, and it's powerful. Alive. It's living. The Word of God is living substance. It does so many things. The word renews our mind. It brings faith into our hearts. It challenges and it opposes. And we had time to keep going here in, in Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. It says the word is living and powerful and sharper than a two-edged sword. It pierces to the dividing asunder of the soul and of the spirit, of the bone and of the marrow. And it is a discerner of the thoughts and of the intents of the heart. See, the Word tells us what's right, and the Word tells us what's wrong. And the rights and the wrongs of what the Word tells us is immutable. We can't change that. Just because it's now the year 2020, and some people would suggest that we're reading out of an archaic book. But truth is timeless. God changed a couple of covenants going forward, but the word's the, the, word's the word. So it's, it's living substance. It's powerful. That's why when you settle down with your Bible and you do your reading, which hopefully is daily, but if it's not daily, don't get condemned. And if after three days you haven't read the Bible, think, oh, I'm so condemned, I'm not going to read it at all. No, just pick it up again. So say, you know, we, sometimes people think that, uh, <laughs> that pastors must surely, every day, without fail, well, I've got to be honest, I miss, I miss my reading. I just sometimes, and then I get back to it again, just pick myself up again. And don't let the devil condemn me. It's none of his business anyway. Because the devil's trying to keep me from the word. He knows where the power comes from. He knows where the seeds are. So 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23, For you have been born again, not of seed which is perishable, but imperishable, that is, through the living and enduring Word of God. So the Bible tells us here that the Word of God is, li is living, it's enduring, and it's imperishable seed. Imperishable seed. And it is powerful towards producing a harvest of God's promises in your life. I got a little container of seeds in my pocket. I wasn't sure if I should bring it out, but anyway, here it is. I thought I'd bring it along and see if this perhaps helps somebody. I reached into my grain sack and I pulled out some organic wheat. I was going to bring rye. But I've run out of rye, so I need to buy some rye in the next while. And I do silly things, you know, like I take this grain and I put it through my flour mill and then I bake good bread and then I'm feeling good about myself because I'm doing something that's healthy. <laughs> and, uh, and I've got seeds here. This could be spelt. I had some spelt as well. Uh, this is wheat. Um, and, you know, with this little, if I were to put this on the scales... There might only be about six, seven, eight grains of seeds there. But potentially, I could cover the whole surface of the world with wheat just out of this little bit of seed. The whole world. If we could clear everything else that's there <laughs> and everything that's now not fertile and airy, we could cover the whole world. Right? Because when you sow this little bit into a little 
garden bed and then let it grow up and then harvest those seeds. Uh, we put down, we put down, say six, seven, eight grams. We pull up two kilos. Then we sow all of those two kilos and then we pull up 35 kilos. And you keep going. You can absolutely. Uh, God's word is unlimited. It'll just keep producing. So don't put a ceiling into your life. And don't try to be holy and all pious and say, oh, we don't really want any more money. You know, we got enough. And say, well, well, why don't you be thinking about somebody else? Keep going and let the prosperity of God flow into your life. And so you're able to help other people. It goes way beyond <laughs> what God wants us to do for ourselves. This is about the kingdom of God. So we're talking about taking seeds of the word of God. And sowing them into our heart. Salvation scriptures are sal salvation seeds that will produce a harvest of salvation in a person's life. That's why when we want somebody to get saved, we really want them to hear the salvation scriptures that you must be born again, otherwise you cannot see the kingdom of heaven. Or where it says that with, with, you know, with the heart man believes and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. We speak to them about Jesus Christ and it's all part of the gospel, the, 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 the pure gospel of salvation to bring that to somebody. They are seeds of salvation. If they receive it, and they clear away the doubt and unbelief and, and all of this other stuff, and we help them through our prayers, then that will result in a harvest of salvation in their lives. If you take healing scriptures, they are healing seeds that if you consistently sow them into your heart and let the heart do its thing and let the seed do its thing, it will produce a harvest of divine healing in your life, bodily healing. Of course, there is the, the gifts of the Spirit, and there are those miracles, and that's all wonderful. But if somebody takes the Word, they can move towards healing and receive healing if they go through the process of sowing the seed, first the blade, then the head, and then the full grain in the head, and then he puts in the sickle. The harvest has come. A person is healed. If you take prosperity scriptures... And sow the prosperity seeds into your heart. And don't let nobody talk you out of it that it's God's will for you to prosper. You've got to watch your seed. As I say, uh, I, I listen to different people, different ministers. And as soon as I hear a, a poverty preacher, I just turn him off right there. Just boom, click, gone. I do not want the prosperity seeds to be uprooted by some pious guy who thinks he's doing God a favor by preaching poverty to the people. God's a prosperity God. As I say, it, it took me so long. It took me so long. I come from a religious environment where the ministers vowed a vow of poverty when they stepped into ministry. And then sometimes that, they lead other people into that, same, into that same poverty thing, and it's just not God's will. So it took me a long time to uproot those old seeds. Poverty seeds. As I say, it's always amazed me how a, a man or a woman can preach on poverty and make it sound like it's a holy thing. It's always amazed me how sometimes they manage to put scriptures together and say, so, gosh, you know, but it's still wrong. Poverty is wrong. Poverty did not start to operate in the earth in the Garden of Eden until sin came in. Adam and Eve turned away from God, and poverty was the result of it. We turn our hearts back to God, and prosperity is God's will. Jesus says, I've come that you might have life, and that you might have it more abundantly. So take prosperity scriptures, sow them, and let it bring it all the way through to a harvest of prosperity. Last year, we have celebrated our 30th anniversary since the planting of this church, this house. We have a little bit of history now to look back over. And it's never ceased to amaze me when you watch somebody, you know, they come, in, come into the house and then they settle down and they take a hold of the word. 
And then you watch them three, four, five years later, and something has happened. They, they take a hold of, of the pro- I'm, I'm looking at some of your lives, and I, I, it just thrills me when somebody comes from a, from a place of nothing and comes into a place of, of doing well. And uh, I was just meditating on this whole thing, and I was reminded when Jacob left his house, and he went to Laban's house, because there's Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And Jacob was Esau's brother. And for those of you that have read the Old Testament, you will remember that Jacob stole Esau's birthright. And he stole the blessing. And then he decided to run away because he didn't feel safe around his brother. So he stole his brother's birthright and then he ran away. And then now he's with Laban, with his uncle. And he served Laban for seven years for for a wife. And then... (laughs) Laban gave him, not the pretty one, but he gave him the other one, for some of you that know the story. So I said, all right. <laughs> so, all right. So he says, I'll serve you another one if you give me the pretty one. Uh, and uh, so Laban, uh, Jacob served Laban for 14 years. And then he served him another six years. And then Jacob was absolutely loaded. I mean, he had wives. And actually, you really only need one wife. You know, I was just talking with somebody the other day. Um, and if you're a woman, you only need one husband. You know, we, rather than having plenty of wives, you only need plenty of one wife. That's all you need. All right. Um, anyway, Jacob had two, and it caused a bit of problem, which is wood, because it's not really God's perfect will. Um, and so anyway, so Jacob gets to the place where he, he will grab his two wives, he'll grab all of his kids and all of his wealth, and he leaves Laban, and he goes home again. And before he gets home, he's suddenly realizing, oh, gosh, I'm going to meet my brother, and I stole his birthright, and he's going to be angry with me. He might kill me. So what he does is he takes off all of his livestock, and by now the guy's loaded. I mean, he is wealthy. It's, it's unbelievable. He's got a whole herd of cattle with him, of camels and sheep and goats and stuff, and there's a whole caravan. So he divided it into two companies. Although, gosh, you know, if he hits, hits us, he will only hit one company. In fact, no, what we'll do is uh, we'll send them smaller companies ahead and servants. And, 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 and he says, look, take some of this stuff. Take 20 cows and uh, a few of these and a few of these and go ahead. And if you meet Esau and he says, what is this all about? Say, this is a gift for you, uh, Esau, so that, you know, hopefully you won't kill me. So he's dividing all of his stuff up into different companies. And I've been thinking about this. You know, before he gets home, before he meets his brother, uh, Jacob begins to pray. And it suddenly dawned on him like, gosh, God, when I went out, I only had a stick in my hand. And now I've become two companies. And it's taken 20 years. Walk out with a stick, with a measly stick in his hand. Virtually nothing on his back. 20 years later, he's loaded. So there's a story in that alone. So say, I've watched people come into this house. I got the benefit. I've actually been around the long, longest, like my wife and I, and just a few foundation members. We've been around the longest. We got the benefit now of looking back. We've seen people come in with nothing but a stick. And you watch them two, three, four, five years later. Seven, eight, ten people, even young people that have grown up here, and now they're a company. Sometimes people work in short time increments. God works in long time increments. Sometimes people say, well, let's, you know, let's uh, start, start this tithing business and see what happens. So they tithe this week, and the next week they say, where's my harvest? <laughs> it's seed, time, and harvest. It's seed, time, and then the harvest. And it's during the time that you've got to watch your heart. And it's during the time that you stay positive and praise God that the blessing of God are flowing in your life even before you see them. It's during the time that you fight against discouragement. It's during the time that you fight the devil and not let him talk you out of it. And can I suggest this, and you know, inevitably... If you say something and share your heart, somebody's going to misread it, and out of the, uh, you know, out of the messed upness of their own heart, they will charge you for it. But friends, there is an anointing on this house of restoration. 
the number of people that we've seen coming in messed up in their head, messed up in their heart, messed up in their relationship, messed up in virtually every area of their life. But as soon as they lay a hold of the word, God brings order back into where there's chaos. People come in with nothing but a stick. And next minute you look, and next minute they've got a place of their own, they've got a good job, they, they started a career, and next minute that it's part of the anointing on the house. We're a prosperity house. And, and if I can say this without sounding, sounding like, you know, like I'm blowing my own trumpet, but, you know, Pastor Ray and I, we're prosperity people. But being in this house, you associate, you, there is an anointing that begins to flow that will usher you into a new place in terms of what God has for you. That's why, as I say, you, would, you don't want to join poverty houses. So Jacob says, gosh, it's like God. I left here 20 years ago. I crossed the Jordan with nothing but a stick. And now I've become two companies. It's amazing. When the anointing begins to flow, we operate in the wisdom of God. Jacob took the word that his father taught him about the covenant that they had with God, starting with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Isaac taught him. And Jacob taught it to his boys and all the way through uh, that covenant that we have with God. It is a covenant of prosperity. But you've got to do what the word says. So God's word is full of seeds of healing Seeds of salvation, seeds of peace, seeds of prosperity, seeds of everything that you will ever need. So this is when Pastor Vanessa put the victory program together. It was with this purpose in mind to help people to take the word and to sow it consistently into their hearts by confessing the word over and over and over to solidify, to sow the word into their heart, the engrafted word, so they can bring forth. If you haven't got a copy, I'd encourage you to get one. Number three, on your outline, God's word is able to build you up and give you an inheritance. In Acts chapter 20, verse 32, here is Paul speaking to the Ephesian elders that he had gathered together as he's on his way to Jerusalem and he's encouraging them, he's praying for them, and he's, he's giving them the word. What does he do? He says, you will not see me again. What does he do? He gives them the word. So now, brethren, verse 32, I commend you to God and to the word of his grace which is able to build you up and to give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. Now, every Christian virtually knows that God is able to do things. But Paul tells us that God's Word is able to do things. There is creative power within the Word. Those seeds that I have in my little container here, in the natural, they have creative power to reproduce themselves over and over and over perpetually. That's why I said we could cover the whole world with wheat. <laughs> Not that we want to. So God's word is able to give you all that God has promised you. God has designed the seed of his word, to meet your need. And sometimes people don't understand, but sometimes somebody might come and say, look, I, I believe that God's given me a scripture for you. And, you know, I just believe that God wanted you to know some, whatever it is, or Proverbs, or something out of the gospel, who knows? I, I believe God, that word is for you. And somebody that does not understand might say, gosh, you don't understand. I, I got such needs, and, and what you're doing is you're giving me a word? 
Yeah, well, that, that word is a seed. That can, if you understand the process, translate towards a harvest. But a lot of things don't take place overnight. They just take effort and they take time. So I said earlier on, Jacob became a company, two companies over the space of 20 years. And there's something about, you know, seven years, another seven years, another six years. God actually works intergenerationally. I haven't got time for this, but I sometimes have a talk with people about what God's intentions really is. God says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. So what that means is that in God's thinking, God wants to prosper every generation so that they not only have enough for themselves and their kids, but they can put something aside for their grandkids. And if every generation that has now produced us, this generation, had done the right thing, then all of us would have received a house from our grandparents. But guess what? <laughs> a lot of our grandparents just didn't understand what we're discussing here. And, you know, there was the Great Depression and all of this stuff going on. And then sometimes parents try to do something for their kids, but God thinks intergenerationally. And if Jesus does not come in our lifetime, or for that matter, in our children's lifetime, which would absolutely highly surprise me, then the question is, what are you leaving for your grandchildren? Because God says a good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. And to do that, you've got to prosper. You can't cling to poverty. You've got to allow God to shift you into a new place, to bring you to your wealthy mountain. Where's that Psalm 89 or whatever it is? God wants to bring every single one of us to our wealthy mountain. Prosper us, increase us. So God's word is able. We know God's able. Paul tells us that God's word has ability. Able, the word able there comes from the Greek word dunamai. And that's kind of the root word from which we get the, 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 the word dynamis, which is miraculous power. Jesus says, you shall receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. What he said, he said, you shall receive dynamis after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. And we know the Holy Spirit has the power. The Holy Spirit is the power. But we're actually learning that God's Word also has power. And it has power to give you your inheritance. It is miraculously powerful to produce a harvest in your life. We just need to understand the process and work the process. And somehow, God's really into stability. So that God works intergenerationally. God works in longer time frames than what we do. And sometimes through people's impatience and their fleshly impulses, they're always off to something else. The same people that, you know, have been in this house for a long time, and I'm talking a decade or two, or young people that have grown up, as I say. I mean, we've really seen the blessing of God just unfolding. It hasn't happened overnight, but it continues to unfold. And I see some of our young people, and I can always say, wow, you guys are doing so good. I'm impressed how you have taken the word, the principles, and you make it work for yourself. The trouble is the average Christian is always in a new church every two, three years. They, they, they're there until they get offended and then they walk out. And then, you know, sometimes people manage to stay a bit longer. And, and even to the stage where they're a small company, they came with nothing but a stick. But now they're a small company and next minute they're off and now they're offended. And sometimes you don't even see any gratitude, which tells us that there are still hindrances there. Because thankfulness is a big key in order for us to develop our heart to a stage where it'll produce, it'll produce consistently and it'll produce quickly. <laughs> now, I, I haven't got any, I'm not offended. 
can't afford to be offended. I'm not going to mess up my heart. But sometimes you see things and say, well, you know, they could have done that better. You know what? They didn't have to say that. You know what? They didn't have to fire those parting shots. Because really we did nothing but try to help. It really, sometimes it's a very sad situation, but you know what? My heart's good. I'm just, <laughs> no offense. No chip on my shoulder. No, no, no hurt in my heart. You just let it go. But sometimes you know people can do better. Psalm 117, or 107 rather, verse 19 and verse 20 speaks about the Israelites. It says, They cried out to the Lord in their trouble, and He saved them out of their distresses. He sent His word and healed them and delivered them from their destructions. God sent His word to heal them. This is amazing. God sent His Holy Spirit, and we're not in any way minimizing you know, the Holy Spirit's function and the need for the Holy Spirit to be Spirit-filled. We're just focusing now in our teaching. We're just focusing on the Word. God sent His Word and healed them. God used His Word, the seed of His Word, to heal them. Psalm 55, I want to move quickly now. Verse 10, God speaking, He says, For as the rain comes down, and the snow from heaven and does not return there, but water the earth and make it bring forth and bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater. So shall my word be that goes out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing for which I sent it, or unto which I sent it. So there's multiple layers going on right here. I'll just briefly touch on this and then we'll wind up. Then we'll have communion together. Which Pastor Vanessa will lead. God sent his word into the earth. And he says it does not return to him void, but it shall accomplish. In the primary instance... God sent his word because when he lost his kids in the Garden of Eden, he says, I want my kids back. And one day, that word that he sent into the earth will result in a multitude, an innumerable company of believers in heaven. Now, not everybody's going to get to heaven. The Bible speaks of a hell. Those who reject Christ, uh, you know, there is a hell, which is just the stark reality of it. But nonetheless, God sent his word, those who receive it and get saved, they will end up in heaven. That's God's harvest. God sent his word into the earth. God sent his word to humanity where generation after generation the word is proclaimed and, and people receive it and get saved and God will get the harvest of souls. Then... God sends his word into a country through missionaries because what God sees he doesn't like when there's poverty, there's oppression, there is control and manipulation and, and wrong regimes and all of this other stuff. God sends his word because he wants to turn that situation around. And he wants to have a harvest of a nation that is living for God with the prosperity that God is intended, with the peace that God is intended, and with everything that God is intended. If there's a whole nation unto God, things will flow well. The darkest places on the face of the earth, spiritually, economically, socially, in every other way, are places where they're lacking the truth of God's word. We could do a study, and we've touched on that some years ago, that uh, if we were to ask where we would really like to live, you know, it's one thing to go for holidays somewhere to some exotic, some tropic place, but if we wanted to live somewhere and raise a family somewhere, most likely if we had the choice to be all around the world or anywhere really, most of us would choose a Reformation country. 
in a Reformation country are the countries where the Reformation, where the gospel has taken hold, be that America, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and places like this, uh, where the gospel was preached and has shaped the judicial system, has cha- shaped the governmental systems, and shaped the social systems. We would all pick a place like that because God has sent his word and it's been received and it's built society. The leftist people are now trying to uproot the gospel seeds and the word of God and do away with it. A decision has just been made where Bibles in schools, really its days are numbered by our current government. So um, I could go on for some time. I'm not going to now, but I'm telling you, we need to fight to leave the word of God in the nation to leave the name of Jesus or put the name of Jesus back into parliamentary prayer and not let these godless people uproot everything, the seeds that God has sown into the nation generation after generation after generation because if we don't fight for this, we are going into darkness. There's no other place. Communism is not that far away. Marxism is uh, coming back by stealth. We need to fight for a free world. And because one of the ways we do that is to have the word of God, to live it, to promote it, and in our sphere of influence, do what we can in order to retain the truth of God's word. God sent his word, and it will not return to him void, but it shall accomplish that which he pleases, and it shall prosper in the thing unto which he has sent it. So unto which thing has God sent the word? Specifically and primarily into your heart. <laughs> your heart and my heart and the heart of our nation is the seed, bed where the seed needs to be sown so it can bring forth the harvest. So just as Pastor Vanessa gets ready to come to lead us in our time of sharing communion together, I have a couple of questions. Um, I really have it on my heart that we start the year good and that we start the year right, that we set ourselves up, position ourselves to experience everything that God has for us. So a few questions. How prepared is your heart this year to receive the seed of God's word? How thorough have you been in plowing up the hard areas of your heart? How thorough? And then, how committed were you in digging up the rocks of shallowness in your life? Or how diligent have you been in clearing away the thorns of selfishness? And then finally, what is the level of your committedness to present your heart to God, clean and holy. So with that, uh, I invite Pastor Vanessa to come and let's share communion together. Let's perhaps have the worship team up as well if we can and have some background music here.